So I used my Sky wages to buy short dated stock. Yeah, these guys said, oh, you know, there's a shop coming up. I know you sell your supplements and bits and bobs. Do you want to take it on? So I was like, well, I can pay three months rent up front. And if it doesn't work, I can just never mention it again. Within six weeks, I'd left Sky. James, very kindly, we never asked him to, said, oh, I've been sent these things by Rick. They're really good. And it sold out. Sold out that weekend. His Strom is in 36 countries. I bought a V10 M5, an F90 M5, a McLaren 600LT. I was fast asleep and I remember waking up. You wake up, I feel strange. Ring an ambulance, like, what? I was like, I think I'm having a heart attack. Um, and I was like, if this is just the way I'm stuck, I don't want to be alive. Today, I'm excited to announce I have a special guest, Richard Foster, owner of Strom Sports Nutrition, co-owner of Fitex, devoted father, and most importantly, someone that started their story into the bodybuilding and fitness industry with the intention of making great supplements. In doing that, you revolutionized the supplement industry within the UK, creating transparent quality products, making health mitigation for PEDs accessible to everyone through his products and services. Besides becoming hugely successful, selling his products in over 36 countries and enjoying the thrill of fast cars, Richard continues to help athletes across the world with a humble approach to life and through his own experiences and unwavering ability to make shit happen. Today we discuss his upbringing, the heart scares that nearly led to his death, dealing with success, as well as a few discussions on PED use. Introducing the new updated Make It Happen podcast with Richard Foster and myself, the host, William Carver. Richard Foster. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on when you're listening to this. <laughs> thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, so thank you for coming down and uh, taking a look around. We had a fantastic cheese toasty. We did have a fantastic cheese toasty. If you're ever in Devon, this I, I don't know where the fuck we are. I know it's in Devon. Near Wales, yeah? Uh, near Wales. Wales is... <laughs> I went through Wales to get here. I shouldn't have gone through <laughs> Wales to get here. Um, it's fantastic. Like, this is such a, an obscure, little out-the-way place. It's actually just off the motorway. Yes. Um, but just for those who haven't been down, I'll try and describe it. Effectively, you come up and it looks like you're coming up the driveway to, like, a private school or, like, an old... It could almost be, like, an ex-army type setup or something. Yep. Massive grand building. I was like, fuck, I've definitely gone to the wrong place. Um, and Will's got the, the content for you, the content studio kind of tucked away. And they've got a little cafe in there. But there's all different businesses all tucked in here. It's a mad, mad little place. Um, so if you're in the area, it's definitely worth popping by. Probably by appointment, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah, that'd be nice. But Or just let me know you're coming by. Um, but yeah, wicked setup. And my first time doing a podcast with anything approaching a professional setup. So that's nice. Yeah, don't read my notes. <laughs> I like to be prepared. <laughs> <laughs> that's the whole point is i don't want you to be prepared at all oh, okay. so i actually wanted to um go back to when you and me met quickly uh body power 2006 i checked i checked it out it was it was seven years ago this year in okay. july so seven seventeen. yes and you were on the muscle rage stand i was on <laughs> with niddy i was actually yeah with niddy yeah. And um, that was when you were, I believe, full of insulin. Yeah. Because you were, you were very big. You kind of done the Rich Piano, like, swell up for the expo thing. I hadn't got... I hadn't By got the like... end of the day, you were less yeah. big. Uh, <laughs> those who don't know Will or didn't know Will in his bodybuilder days, Will was one of these guys, like, you know, traditionally super hard gainer, naturally, uh, naturally very lean, very athletically built. And, uh, and, and Will is someone who's super sensitive to being flat. So start of the day at something like Body Power, Will will be very large and very full. And, and by the end of the day, he'd just deflate a little bit. That's a little um, regular human by the end of the day. Isn't yeah, but Will was uh, one of the athletes that I spoke to. You get a lot of guys at these things and they're excited to be on a booth and they, you know, they're excited to see their friends and that's all great. You know, we have, we have athletes now that have different levels of enthusiasm for supplements, but supplements have always been my kind of obsession. And Will was the only athlete I spoke to that really gave a crap about the product and what was in the product and, and how it might help people and the, and the science side of things. Funny enough, you know, that interest came from working in a uh, supplement shop early on and just, I didn't want anyone to come into that shop and ask about product and I didn't know what was in it. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know, I just, I guess it was my young attitude of being, having a bit of an ego, like wanting to know everything. And, and you were working with a brand that used to import American products yeah. and it was, it was back like now, 
you can't just import American products and go, well, these are better. It's like, yeah, we know they're better because the rules in America are basically just all what you want. Yeah. Um, but but there were there were a few products that those guys did that were just really, really good. Fantastic. Um, I actually, remember having yeah. a really in-depth chat with Will, and I think you already knew Andrew Keeler at that point. I, yes, vaguely knew Andrew, yeah. And we were – Strom was a small thing then. Like um, Andrew was our only athlete. Um, and Andrew was our only athlete because when we first started – uh, I'd, I'd, I'd had the opportunity to take on this little shop and then I had the opportunity to kind of bring out our own first product, which was Vascumax. Yeah. And I spoke to loads of people about it and those people are, oh, that, that won't work. And just the normal negative stuff that I'm sure you've had starting a business. Not People don't try to be dicks. People just can be a little limited in the way they, they think about things. And Andrew was the one guy that was like, fucking do it. Like, what's the worst that can happen? Um, He was the only guy that never said don't. So he'll be like, someone said to me the day, how come Andrew's still a sponsor? I feel like he doesn't compete or do anything. And I was like, it doesn't matter. Same as you. He'll he'll always be a part of that unless he turns around and says, I don't want to. Um, but Andrew spoke very, very highly of you. Um, and I remember we came away and said he would, Will would fit what we're trying to make really well. Um, in terms of that, knows what he's talking about, has a really good physique doesn't really give a fuck it's funny because i don't know any of this story either so yeah no it was it was a conversation we had because uh, strom when the market's vastly different now oh but at the time sure. there were loads of brands that were selling products that didn't want to admit that steroids were in use it was very much like it was the early on days of gym shark the the forums were very popular back in those days but it was still very hush hush and, C- and certainly quiet. the big brands the big brands didn't talk about it yeah um and, and the they didn't want their athletes to have conversations about what really mm-hmm. goes on. Yeah. You know, like no one's, I, I would never say, and no one, you would never say, oh, um, supplements don't work. But I think, because they really do, good ones really, really do. But yeah. I think a fair conversation to have is that if you want to be the best, you need the best supplements and the best drugs and the best food and the best training. I think I think a lot of the, um, the, 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 the thought towards it was from a lot of bodybuilders is that if if you're not if you're not taking them, what's the point? You know, you're not looking at if you if you're not looking at gear, you're not looking at the right supplements. But then at the same time, the the attitude from supplement companies at the time was, oh no, you only take this, yeah, cell tech, yeah, and it increases Which your is just nonsense muscle right? hypertrophy by ten thousand percent. Yeah, um, I'm sure cell tech was the one that said like five point nine pounds of muscle. They in. used to put ridiculous claims on their labels. I think they still do because America. <laughs> Um, so no, Will was someone that just fitted into that kind of brand. And then with Will, what Will's gone on and done with content for you and Express Media and stuff, um, that, that same mindset comes through of, well, I'm, I'm going to do this. Or, well, can you do that though? Yeah, I'll fucking do that. It, it, it's it, interesting you say that because it was very much like when I pulled away from bodybuilding, I had a gap because it was COVID. It was like two weeks out, COVID happened. Yeah. And I was very much in the mindset of once that season was done, I was I was done competing. And so, like, I was like, well, there's the sign. I'm done now. And then there was that whole year. I was kind of like, I was depressed for a bit, man. Like, I didn't know what to do. It was, a lot of it was COVID. Yeah. And I just got dumped. It was like, I was like, Ugh, having a bit of a cry about yeah. it. Did you much prefer to be the one doing the dumping? Yes, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, and uh, yeah, it was, I pick, started picking the camera back up. Yeah. And that was it. Like, I was all go. Like I was a hundred percent in. It was it was the same the same with everything. Anything that I've done is like, if I'm doing it, I'm I'm all in. Yeah. Well, there's no point otherwise. Yeah, for sure. Particularly with something like this, which is you know uh, the, the media stuff. It's a very crowded market. There's a lot of people doing it. There's a lot of people that are really good doing it. Yeah. Um. You know, if if you had set up doing this, say ten twelve years ago in fitness. Yeah. There was like one or two people doing it. Precisely. Whereas yeah. now, it very much in the same way as supplements actually. You know, like people quite often say to me, "Oh, could you?" I get this a lot. Could you start Strom now? Yeah. Like, no. No. No, because there's Cause too many companies doing you, it you, that are good, and you were kind of the forefront of the real start of that in the UK. Yeah, the, we we came out, and then supplement needs were just behind us, and I get on well with the guys at supplement needs, and then a year or two after that, all the other brands have got in on yeah. actual products for people that mm-hmm. real bodybuilder products, and and but yeah, we we did that first and that does give you that credibility um in the same way that there are a few names in media creation that that stick around right from back in the day absolutely uh um, bailey yeah becca andrews yeah absolutely yeah you know um 
and they'll always have that that credibility because they were there first. So totally. to be recognised now, you've got to do something really special. Yeah, absolutely for sure. No, I agree. I agree. So I actually um, I wanted to go back to your early days because, funny enough, like I don't actually know a lot about Young Rick. I mean, I know drips and drabs. We've been mates for like seven years now. Yeah. So like, I've always heard stories, but I've never sat down with you and really actually had a conversation about how, how where you young? come from. How and, you? And, and, and this is important because I kind of want to go through a little bit of the story about you and how you got to where you are. And so, uh, yeah, I want you to kind of like tell me about like, you growing up a little bit. Winging it, but with maximum enthusiasm. <laughs> like, you might not know how to do something. I bet when you first sat down to do content for Devon Police... Yeah, you didn't necessarily know how to do it, that but you knew that you cool would throw it. yourself into it yeah. with a hundred and ten percent passion. So, I uh, I was born in Lincolnshire, um, and uh, my uh, mum and dad separated quite early. Um, so I used to have that kind of going between households thing, which I think I think, based on conversations I've had more recently. I, I actually think there are positives to that in terms of resilience and stuff and, and your ability to just get shit done. Um, and um, my mum moved to Derbyshire when I was about 12 or 13. So I moved with her, had a few years there. I came back to Lincolnshire, um, which was when I started... Well, I started lifting when I was in Derbyshire because I didn't have a lot of mates. Um, I lived in Derbyshire then? for four years, didn't get laid once. <laughs> how, how old were you when you started training? 14. I was, I was a little bit earlier than you. I think yeah. I started. I think I was just before teens when I started like doing a bunch of push-ups in my bedroom. But that, yeah. that was it. Like the, the gym the I used to go to, plastic York dumbbells. The gym I used to go to was sixteen, but fifteen with your parents' permission. With a guy you owned that lived on the <laughs> same street as me. Um, so kind of fourteen and a half started training because uh, there wasn't a lot to do, and I used to love training for training's sake. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I can still remember. I can still remember being excited to go training now, even though I don't train with weights at the moment. Um, so then I came back to Boston, where I'm from, and turned up and I had a little bit of muscles. So, sort of like, you know, you know, and then my dad used to train a little bit and he had some supplements in the cupboard. I remember him telling me, oh, they're all bollocks, they're all scams. And I started going to a gym called Threadneedle Street in Boston. And um, my dad let me have, uh, they were Nutrisport creatine bombs yeah, and amino bombs. They were, they were like chocolate chocolate flavored chewable creatine tablets uh and i remember i think i might have done some googling i mean this is christ this is a long time ago 18 years ago that was google then yeah um i remember thinking like well they can't sell this stuff if it doesn't do anything now obviously we know that's not necessarily the case yeah. but and I remember having some Googling and trying to persuade me, like, no, look, I've looked this up, creatine, it's really good. It does this, isn't it? Like, oh, well, you can fucking have them then. Um, and um, I then became a little obsessive. I, I am, I have Asperger's, not autism. Well, Asperger's type. But the point is, it's the cool one. Um, can you explain the difference first? Um, so with Asperger's, it's generally more high functioning. Mm -hmm. um, they're all a spectrum of the same thing. Um, but you can have people with autism who really struggle to day to day. Yeah. Um, I, th I think it's important to highlight this because one, a lot of people don't know. And two, I'd probably say it's one of the pieces to your success over the years. I, I've always considered it to be, I think the term for it now is neurodiverse. I always found that whatever I was interested in, I could hyper focus on. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of people that are successful have traits of this across all industries. Because if you want to be really good at something, you don't have balance, do you? You have complete and utter focus on the thing and nothing else. Yeah. And that became supplements for me, yeah. um, which then became PEDs. And actually, the two are very interlinked. I almost don't separate performance enhancing drugs and supplements in my head, other than from a retail perspective, trading standards, um, because they're all trying to do the same thing, aren't they? They're, they're Precisely. Are, they are yeah. substances that we're taking to improve our performance in the gym. Precisely, yeah. Whether they are anabolic in nature or peptides or... For sure. And it, and, it is, and it's too hard to really distinguish the line these days, I think. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And 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 you know what? There's there's loads of stuff that's hugely effective, be it PEDs or be it, be it supplements. Um, so I became, I became quite into that. Um, and then I moved to Wales. And I moved to Wales to be a kayaking instructor, which was the other thing I used to do a lot of. Yeah. 
moved to Wales to be a kayak instructor with my then girlfriend, um, who was my girlfriend because she had a car and I couldn't drive, which is important if you want to go kayaking. Um, and we moved to a, a water sports centre in North Wales and it came with a, a accommodation. So I ended yeah. up living with this girl that I'd only been dating for a few months. Yeah. Um, and her family were Roman Catholic and they weren't very happy about us living together. Uh, so we got married, which was also not the best move I've ever made. Um, <laughs> but with living in North Wales, mail order wasn't really a thing then. It wasn't a thing that was particularly useful. Um, and there was no supplement shop. The nearest supplement shop was Wrexham. So I don't know if you've been to Bala, but Wrexham's about an hour and a bit drive. Not super convenient. So I opened a supplement shop in, in Bala. That was that was the first Strom, and that was 14 years ago now. Oh, wow. Um, and we used to sell Bodytronics. We used to sell uh, Gaspari. Yeah. We used to sell we used to sell a lot of Gaspari, actually. I used to like Gaspari. Yeah, your old packs of muscle. <laughs> yeah, we used to sell uh, MRI. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, MRI black powder and oh, yeah. that yeah, kind I of thing. Yeah. And um, bits and bobs like that. And then it did okay, but limited audience. And then me and my, my ex-wife split up and I was I was working for another company at the time doing doing a normal job and she used to work the shops and I'd work the shops in the evenings and the weekends and stuff. But the business was in her name because she didn't have a job at the time. Mm-hmm. So she relieved me of that when we split up. So Strom kind of right, disappeared yeah. for a couple of years. I moved to Shrewsbury um, as a um, care worker. That's the job I'd fallen into, looking after naughty children and uh, it's, I moved it's to hard, Shrewsbury. It's hard to imagine you ever did that, by the way. Not, 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 not that you're a lovely person, but you're just, I'm not, what you do now is so different. Yeah, you know? I'm also, I couldn't do it now. No. I mean, that's a job that requires extreme tolerance and patience. Absolutely, yeah. I highly respect anyone that does it, but I fucking can. Limited, I think, the, the care work's an interesting job because I was super passionate about it for a while. Me and Badger did it together. The people who are good at it are the people who care. Mm-hmm. Yeah. and the people who care can't do it for more than a few years yeah because it it kills you so the people who do it for 15 20 years are the people that just don't give a fuck um so it's a weird like if you're a bit shit at that job you'll probably stick it it's a bit of a weird paradigm so i moved to shrewsbury which is where strom is now and there was no supplement shop big old town hundred thousand people population if you include mm-hmm. the surrounding boroughs no supplement shop whatsoever and um I got a job working for Sky TV, selling things, which was in the shopping centres. And um, as a result, I got quite friendly with centre management. I guess a little bit like with this place, you kind of got to know the the people that own the yeah. the, the thing. And one day they said, oh, we've got a shop coming. I used to sell supplements out the back of my car. I used to sell, um, I used my Sky wages to buy short dated stock and, and yeah. stuff that was out of stock and whatever. And um, I'd, I'd go to three different gyms. Not because I wanted to go to three different gyms, but just different people to sell to. Absolutely, yeah. You know, I used to, I used to love a little bit of a hustle because, look, my uh, my mum and dad are both hardworking people, um, but we never had a lot growing up. Yeah. So I, I'm quite happy to admit that when I was young, it's very materialistic. Anything I could do to earn money, totally. All for because I want to get, I want, I want to get to that point where I can afford nice things because I've never been able to. I think I think I remember saying to people like I'm not even bothered about nice things. I just want to not have to worry about it. That that's probably the the biggest thing. Like I very much have the same kind of background as you. Like not a lot of my, my mum worked full time. Yeah, and she was a single mother, and so you know, we, we, I'd be out all the time, just you know, filling my time. But it was yeah, very much the case when I when I started to come kind of come of age of realizing that that works around the corner. I was like, I want to make sure I get to a point where I I just don't have to stress about money doesn't buy happiness at no. all and uh not to put too fine a point i'm in a position now where i can afford nice things absolutely and i'd absolutely swap all of it for just more time with my daughter yeah but having money does mean that if the price of electric goes up or something and a lot of people are in this boat at the moment mm-hmm. if you can put yourself in a financially flexible position it takes that stress away because yeah. you know we've all been i've been there um, you know, I've not lived at home since I was 16. You don't want to be in a position, or I've never wanted to be in a position where I don't have a buffer. Because I'm well aware that if I don't have a buffer and shit hits the fan, I don't really have a lot of options. Mm-hmm. I'm a lot closer with my mum and my dad now. I probably would have options now, but certainly when I was younger. Yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, these guys said, oh, you know, there's a shop coming up. I know you sell your supplements and bits and bobs. Do you want to take it on for a couple of months? 
Um, I thought, well, for a couple of months, you know, they, they offered me a three month thing. So I was like, well, I can pay three months rent up front. And if it doesn't work, I can just never mention it again. For sure. Um, and it did really well. Um, I think within six weeks, I'd left Sky. Yeah. Um, I tried to keep it going as long as possible, but Sky kind of came to me like, hey, we know you're doing that thing. We'd rather not sack you if, if you want to just go. Just leave. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it did really well. It was it was one of them things where um, it just felt right. You know, it just worked. But as a retailer, we started to become squeezed by all the things that retailers normally get squeezed by. Discount supplements, Dolphin. People come in and go, well, I can get that online for a 10 yeah, or less. Totally. Like, but I've got business rates to pay. I've got staff wages to pay. I've got mm-hmm. electric to pay. I've got all these things to pay. Mm-hmm. You can't necessarily compete with bedroom sellers and stuff. And there were also a lot of products that I couldn't get because at the time, as we discussed earlier, the industry was a bit of a mess. Yeah. So you had like stuff from America, like Blackstone Labs products that were, were pretty good mostly. Um, and then the British products were... Your whey proteins and your basic products were good from Britain. Quality control in the UK is very good. But what we didn't have was um, things like on-cycle supports. Yeah. And um, and it was, I remember during the time before you made Support Max, like I, the one thing that I was finding to help me quite well was, was Tuka, yeah. which was massively expensive to import. Tuka was, I mean, Tuka's a little better now because there's a lot of people using it. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, at the time, and the only product on the market that was okay was gear support by Blackstone Labs. Yeah. Which was from America. There were some things that I think they had 10 milligrams of tucker in it or something. It was garbage. So we did a stimulant product. We did a pump product and they went, they went pretty well. You know, we were selling a few hundred units to my local, yeah. um, local gyms and stuff. And, and they went okay. The original Stimulamax had uh, amp citrate in, which is almost an amphetamine. So that was brilliant. Oh, brilliant. Um, we only did, we only did that for a couple of, <laughs> couple of hundred tubs. Um, the original Vascomax had a picture of my legs on it. Can we do another like limited run of maybe? I'd like, lo- of so I mean, the way, the way things work at the moment, I could get that made in America, yeah, um, and then I could have an American distributor sell it. And if you, as a customer, bought it in the UK, that's fine, yeah. But I couldn't sell it from my shop. I mean, that would be great, like an OG <laughs> series. Um, but then from I was, we were lucky enough. By this point, um, I think. No, Support Max had just come out before we met. So, no, Support Max came out at the British Finals. Yes. And and that's when there was... UK there was BFF the last, British Finals. Last UK BFF British Finals. Hollingshead won yeah. his pro card. Yeah. And... Um, so and I was then, lucky yeah. enough, I can't remember how. No, I'd sent James some Stimmy Max and some Vasky Max. Yeah. Just because I was a fan of his. Yeah. And he talked about it on the podcast that James, Luke, and Banji used to do. What was it called? Uh, that, ooh, um, I can't remember. I'm thinking of the Hoss now. Yeah, what the fuck was it called? Because it was big for a little, the size game. That's it, yeah. So um, yeah. James, very kindly, we never asked him to, said, oh, I've been sent these things by Rick, uh, the Vascomax, the Support Max, uh, the Stimmy Max. They're really good. And suddenly we started selling these on, on, and this was before kind of influencer stuff were a big thing. Yeah. And it, like, we sold out overnight. I was like, fuck, this is amazing. And then I'd spoken to Ben. I knew Ben quite well, uh, Ben Chow. Yeah. Um, and I'd been speaking to Ben. I said, look, I've got a, I'd been speaking to Crossland as well. And I basically, I went to Dave Crossland. I said, look, I want to do uh, an on cycle support product. Mm-hmm. And this is what I want to put in it. Uh, these are the things that I use and they're hard to get. And I'd love to have your kind of endorsement. I wanted it to be like endorsed by Dave Crossland. Because Dave, I've got a lot of respect for. And Dave kind of said, oh. He had just also had the, the his, construction. His kind, yeah, he just released that. He was quite popular at yeah. the time. And and uh, I, I'd become friendly with Dave. We, he'd stayed at mine a couple of times. And he, he wanted to see more Tucker in the product. And I had to explain to him, like, the product needs to be at a certain price point. The product's too expensive. The market's different now, you know, that people spend hundreds on on-cycle support. But at yeah. the time, no one no one bothered. Yeah. No one bothered. They just took the drugs and it'll be fine. So Dave said he wanted more tug care and we explained that we couldn't, but actually I showed him some blood work from clients because it had the gram of nacocysteine and the, the quarter of a gram of tug care. Actually, it worked pretty fucking well considering that it only had a 250 milligrams of tug care in. And he also wanted to add citrus bergamot, which we did because yeah. citrus bergamot wasn't an ingredient that I'd been using at the time. And... Again, these seem like really basic things, but at the time, no one was doing it. Yeah. And I spoke to Luke and Ben about it at 
a PCA comp in Stoke. I can't remember which one. And they were like, oh, that sounds wicked. Well, if it comes out, we'll, we'll buy some. Yeah. All right. So I messaged Ben when it came out. He went, oh, I'll have six. All right. So I sent him, and he had three, and Luke had three. And uh, James messaged and said, oh, can I get some as well? And then they all talked about it on their podcast, and it sold out. Sold out that weekend. And it was, I was like, what? This is fucking mental. And we got that, more yeah. made. I think Anth Bales bought some. And yeah, then I remember that, yeah. And then JP went on Size Game. And I know JP's a competitor now, but JP used to use quite a lot of our, our products. Yeah. JP went on the Size Game and said that he used it. And again, it just went nuts. Um, because it was, it was probably the most cost effective way of getting those ingredients. Oh, totally. Because I mean, I used to buy in Tugco on its own yeah. for more or less the same dosage. Same amount of caps for like 40 quid. Yeah, and you, so you get loads of other stuff with this. Yep. So that then gave me the cash flow. Um, it's, it's like your first big job. Gave mm -hmm. me the cash flow to expand quite rapidly. We didn't want to take on debts or loans. And I think one of the next products we did was Glycomax. Because I was big yeah. into GDAs. Matador was... You wanted to do a drink. I remember. Yeah. Yeah, the drink never the drink never came to fruition. But, yeah, well, um, I, 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 I think I proposed that it would probably cause issues gut-wise if you're going to start loading a load of fluids before you want to eat. And Bernie. Yeah, Bernie, and Bernie. as well. Yeah. Um, but, so Will was big into GDAs, and we talked a lot, and, and actually Will basically formulated Glycomax. Um, I tweaked about with the dosages a little bit and, and made it viable and fitted it in, but I went to Will, I said, look, if you could pick five ingredients to go in a GDA, what would they yeah. be? Will wrote them out. I went, right, okay, we'll get a sample of that made. And then the, the version that came out was slightly tweaked from that. But actually, most people don't know. And Glycomax is still one of our best-selling products. And because, yeah. it, because it works. Like, Glycomax came out, and again, this was when influence and stuff, it, no one was doing these products. Yeah. So it was amazing. I remember Joe Jeffrey, who, you know, we've talked about this before. Joe, I love you, but we didn't get on at the time, and you know it. Um, <laughs> People like Joe... <laughs> such a love-hate relationship between you guys. <laughs> ...bought the products and were posting on Facebook and stuff. Like, I've taken this GDA and my BG's dropped by two points. It was strong. And we'd be like, yeah, that's the point. Like, yeah, but it works. Like, yeah, no, that's the <laughs> point. And that was so unheard of. It was It was, It was. was a lot stronger than we, what, we, mm. what we considered it was going to be. Well, initially, it was going to be dosed at five caps, which was a gram of bourbon yeah, and all I remember the other that. bits. Yeah, and, and, I mean, that would send people hypo. Yeah, which was unheard of with a with a, and then we we went off and we did a load of other stuff, um, and everything was quite bespoke and everything, and and we had this period of rapid growth where Luke was on the team very briefly, yeah, uh, Ben was on the team for for a while, and and we tried to make everything that a bodybuilder would need, and you were at the time still taking plenty of PEDs, and yeah, and we ended up in this position somehow after about probably two years after I met you, where if you were a bodybuilder. Everything you would need, we did. Yeah. And then what we've done since then is we've gone through this weird period of doing all the really niche shit. So we do products now. I mean, if you've got a product that's super niche, but you're the only product catering to that, you've still potentially got quite a big market. So yeah, we do sure. the the Lipid Max, P5P, Keolic Garlic, loads of really niche stuff as well now. Um, but but they've all kind of filled in loads of gaps and done really well. But but that period, probably from about the time you came on board to about Support Max Joint coming out, was was just it was nuts, ridiculous. Like you really just kind of like you solidified your place as the the brand to be looking at. Yeah, you know? but it and was it was you know it was a combination effort of everyone because you know oh, I, had, sure, I had Ben yeah. was amazing at getting stuff in front of the moons aligned. Yeah, Everything absolutely. Just like lined up perfectly. Couldn't repeat that. Yeah. Because best one in the world now, if you were to bring out a range of really, really good products and you give them to, I mean, Holland Z is still arguably, not even arguably, the best UK IFBB pro. Yeah. Nathan Jash is very good as well, but slightly different kind of section of the market. But if, if you were to give James a range of really, really good products now, people would be interested, but there's 10 other brands doing things that are similar. Um, so yeah, it just we were really, really lucky, um, but that's kind of how we've got to where we are now. Yeah, more or less. Yeah, um, nice little um, segue onto that. Seeing as uh, the the business has kind of helped you with this this part of your life, but cars, <laughs> cars, <laughs> cars of the 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 journey of cars over the last couple of years has well, been. I, 
I said before Brilliant. that if I'm into something, I become obsessed with it. Yeah. Um, and I do. I love cars. I love cars. Ever since we met, you had, you had an Audi. What was it? When we first met, you had an Audi. Was it an A3? A3. I had a few A3s, yeah. You had an A3. I had an, I had an, Octo, I had was, an Octavia 1.6 diesel. It was, it was diesel. You always used to... Oh, it does 60 miles to the gallon. <laughs> I'm very proud of that. Um, and, um, yeah, things things have... Things have progressed car-wise. Um, you, so I've driven down here in my Range Rover. Yeah, can you give me an example of um, a few of the cars you bought this year? This year? Yes. By 2022? 20, yes, yes, just gone. Oh, I, I could try and run through all the cars that I bought in 2022. Yes, please. Um, because, but, so I, I nearly died end of 21, start of 22. Which we're going to talk about as well. So I kind of went on a bit of a mental, fuck it, I've spent like seven or eight years saving, do the thing. Yeah. So uh, I bought an F90 M5, yeah, um, the the four wheel drive one, um, which Christian Chapman bought off me. Yeah, I bought a V10 M5. Yeah, which Christian Chapman bought off me. Um, I bought a McLaren 600LT, yeah, which was phenomenal. I put five thousand miles on that and uh, didn't post any of it publicly. And I think this is the first time I've publicly said that I have any form of supercar. Um, because I'm always, the British public is not great at welcoming success. No, and you've been, I remember in the beginning you got, because you were so, you expanded so rapidly and, and obviously you, you, you in the right at the beginning you, you got off a couple of cars and there was a few people that were not too. Yeah, I mean the thing people have to understand now and the thing I'm completely comfortable with is Strom is in 36 countries. We send yes. pallets and pallets of things abroad um our margin as a company is uh i know exactly what it is because we did our accounts the other day uh i had to do my end of year and it's it's nine percent so we're not making you know 20 pound on every 30 pound product no and i, I explain this but whenever... the volume is huge yeah and i explain when people contact me oh you've got a discount code bro like if we do, there's no discounts. I'm afraid, yeah. like there's there's no margin for it. Yeah, and and, and honestly, it is it's between nine and eleven percent across the board with the company. But I've saved for a very long time, and the volume the company does is very very large. Yeah. Um. So I bought a McLaren. Um. About four weeks before Christian bought his, yeah. and then he told everyone I copied him. Um. And I, I had quite a few issues with that, and I sold it to Ferrari and bought a Ferrari. Yeah. Uh, I bought a Ferrari 488, which is one of the most beautiful cars I think that's ever been made. Yeah, it's stunning. Um, but it doesn't handle quite as well as a McLaren. So I bought a McLaren 720. <laughs> but I do still have the Ferrari. Yeah. And it's been on my to-do list to sell that. Yeah. But I haven't sold it. I can see why you haven't sold it yet. Well, because I got it true. and I was like, right, I'm going to get the McLaren. I need to sell the Ferrari. And I got them both. I was like, I can, I can kind of afford to keep them both. Yeah, at least for a bit. And what's <laughs> nice with supercars, um, sounds crazy, but you lose less money on them than you do on... If you go out and buy... Yeah, so I believe the uh, year before last, when you went through quite a few cars, you you actually made a little bit of money, didn't you? Yeah, buying, I think so, yeah. Yeah, it, you know, it varies. But Here and there anyway. Yeah, I mean, look, you go and buy, um, I don't know, go and buy a a, a 540D from yeah. BMW, brand new, for 60 grand, mm -hmm. and you drive that for two years, it's a 40 grand car. Yeah. If you're lucky. Yes. I won't say exactly what my Ferrari was, but I imagine I can run that for a year or two, and probably not, depending on what the global markets do. For sure. Probably not lose a huge amount on it. Um, yeah. I also got a Tesla on business lease this year because as a business, I needed a... Uh, the, because of the electric car thing, they're, they're fully deductible. Yeah. Um, and I think that's fantastic. And I'm a massive petrol head. The Tesla's a brilliant tool to get yeah. around in. Um, you know, certainly for short journeys, family car, really, really good thing. And the charging infrastructure is what makes them work. But the one car I've always loved... Is a Range Rover. Yeah, and you've I, had a lot of Range Rovers. I've had, I've had far too many. Do, do you know Rovers. how many you've had over over the duration? Six, six, six Range Rovers. Um, I've had two L three two twos. Yeah, I've had one 
Um, P38. I've had three. Oh, I've had three L405s. When I did have a Range Rover Classic, so seven. Um, but the L405, which is the not the latest shape, but the kind of 2013 to 2020 shape Range Rover, yeah, which I think's a really good car. I've had two in the past, and I've been a fucker in the past for having stuff on PCP. Yeah, because I'd rather have the money in my in my bank. Yeah, for sure. You are, well, it's only six hundred quid a month. It's only eight hundred quid a month. But the two Range Rovers I've had previously that were like that, they were fifty, sixty grand cars, and I had them on PCP. And uh, very quickly, once the novelty wore off, I felt quite bad about having this great big debt on something that's just going to depreciate horrendously because Range Rovers do depreciate horrendously. Sure. So the one I've got now, I bought outright for twenty five grand. It's an eighty thousand miles on the clock. And I absolutely adore it because it's old enough and kind of scruffy enough that you don't worry about it too much. Yeah, for sure. So you use it like a proper truck. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's wicked. I mean, I've done five hours in it today to get down here. Yeah. It's done 36, 37 miles to the gallon. That's brilliant. Perfect comfort. Um, yeah, fantastic vehicles. What would you say is the favorite car you've owned to date? That McLaren 600 LT. I wish I'd kept that. Is that is that your biggest regret? I sold it. I had I had a spate of problems, and I was like, right, fuck this. I'm like McLaren had done it; they'd fixed it all under warranty. Yeah. But I went, fuck this. I'm going to Ferrari, and literally picked it up from the dealership, drove to Ferrari. I was like, what will you give me for this? I want to buy a Ferrari because it was kind of a thing in my head of like, yeah. it's a box of ticking it. I've owned a Ferrari. <laughs> yeah. Um, but McLaren they make race cars with number plates, and the yeah. 600 LT. I don't know how into you McLaren models are, but the 600 LT is yeah. like the hardcore version of their smallest car. For sure, yeah. And it handles incredibly. Um, whereas Ferrari, they make more... It is a supercar, but it's it's a supercar for when you're in your late 40s and you want to show the boys down the pub and you want to drive across France yeah. and go to a wine tasting, in my opinion. It's, it's a fantastic thing, but it's just a little bit softer. Yeah. It's beautiful, but... Um, yeah, that 600 LT, I, I should have kept that. That was phenomenal, um, which is why I ended up buying another McLaren. You always uh, you always miss that, the Jag XKRS as well, don't you? I do always miss the Jag XKRS more than anything because I couldn't buy one back now. And, and that colour was... Beautiful. Nuts. Yeah, uh, Paris blue. <laughs> but So the Jag XKRS, I bought it from a scrapyard in 20, 2020, COVID year. Yeah. Um, bought it from a scrapyard for 19 grand. And I spent four or five grand on parts to get it fixed and we had to go a bit resprayed it had been in a front end crash and then i sold it for 30 so i made five on it um and i regretted selling it um and the guy i sold it to was a bit of a mong he ran it into the ground um but i think he sold it with like bald back tires and an engine management light on and god knows what else Didn't he done flip to it. it he sold it for 40 and it's it's a it's a previous cat s right previous write-off if you want one that's not been in an accident, you're looking at 50 or 60 grand now, um, <laughs> which is a lot of money. So the XKRS is is it's not really any faster than the normal XKR. It's just got a few go-faster bits on it. And yeah. it's it's this weird thing where it's like 5% better, but 50% more money yeah. than a normal XKR. But I do love a Jag. Do yeah, love a Jag. You do love your Jags. Mm. So I want to I go back. Uh, the, the point you highlighted earlier is you nearly died. Yeah, that was fun. Um, and it, it was it was a hell of an experience. And I think, um, you know, it, especially it wasn't until afterwards because because there was an element of like a lot of a lot of your friends around you kind of had to leave you to it because because I told them all to fuck off. Basically, yeah, you were difficult to deal with at the time, but I wasn't able to fully understand that entirely until I spoke to you. You know, but. I, there was always an element of like, right, leave him to his thing, you know. And it, when you did finally explain to me, I was like, Phew. I've Damn. always been fiercely independent. And, and I was very much, when I first got ill, we, we didn't know what was, whether I had like heart failure or... So I was like, I'm going to I'm going to fix this, leave me the fuck alone. Can you go back to when it started happening? Yeah, so... Um, I put, I'm absolutely fine now and it was nothing to do with steroids and... <laughs> all the other rumours that went around at the time. <laughs> I um, I was asleep. I was fast asleep, and I remember waking up, 
and going, no, it was, it'd been a bit of a weird night. I'd had a funny feeling in my mouth all night. Yeah. I couldn't settle. I felt kind of, I guess you would call it anxious. Um, I remember saying, I'm going to bed early because I just feel a bit off. Mm. But 11 o'clock, I got up to pee. And you know when you pee forever? You know, I don't remember drinking this much. Yeah. And it, I, again and again, almost like you'd had a diuretic. Yeah. I got up and peed and peed and peed and peed and peed. And there's loads of stuff we never got to the bottom of it. So don't ask me to explain all of these things because we never we found a solution without explaining everything that had happened. Yeah. And it got to like half 12 and I got up. And I was like, I feel funny. Um, and there was someone saying, um, and I was like, you wake up, I feel strange. She's like, what? And I don't know. And I kept feeling... You know when you um you go over a bump in the car or you you fall off a you fall off a step that you didn't know was there you have that moment yeah. of like oh. I kept having that I was like what the fuck is going on um and then my arm started to hurt like hit like like squeeze it yeah someone was squeezing my arm I was like oh that that's a bad thing yeah ring an ambulance like what I was like I think I'm having a heart attack ring an ambulance um she rang an ambulance and and just as she started ringing the phone, I, I felt like I was going to pass out. I felt dizzy. And I remember having all those thoughts that people tell you have, like, is this, this is how it ends. Yeah. Like just normal day. I was, I was sat playing fucking Starcraft three hours ago. Like this is it game over. So I kind of passed out and I lied down and then my, my pulse shot through the roof. Didn't know what it was, but I knew my pulse was going very, very fast. And they were saying the ambulance was going to be like an hour. I was like, fuck, like, I put on some clothes, get me to the hospital. Um, she drove me to the hospital. I got there. I kind of came in and I, I remember like I was shaking like a shitting dog, tapping on the window of the reception. I think I'm having a heart attack. Please help me. Please help me. And she's like, yeah, we'll be with you in a minute. And I, I've learned a lot. It turns out if you have a heart attack, it's not that like, for most people, it's not that violent. You have a moment and then you're dead. Yeah. Like it's something that goes, it's, it's, Progressive. A heart attack is an arrhythmia. If you have heart stoppage, which is where your heart just stops, which is what people think a heart attack is, you yeah. just die. You're yeah. fucked. Yeah. A heart attack is actually when your heart goes out of rhythm. Yeah. Um, and that can that can be something that takes goes on for a long time. So the woman seemed very calm, and um, I was like, "Why is no one paying attention?" <laughs> I actually I pushed in front of someone. Yeah. Um, I was like, "I'm having a heart attack," and. Uh, the woman was like, well, you know, it's all right. Fill in this form. I was like, I can't fill in a fucking form. I'm having a heart. And then I, and then I fainted again. Yeah. Um, and then they, um, I, I kind of came round. They took me into the ops room and they put me on and my pulse was 220. Yeah. And uh, I was like, what the fuck's going on? Like, I need to see a doctor. As far as I was concerned, like, this is like any moment now I'm going to be gone. And no one seems to give a fuck. What I didn't understand at the time, and I, I learned a lot about heart, related things as time went on because it took a long time for us to get a diagnosis is that if your pulse is kind of 200 and your rhythm is normal no one cares if your rhythm is normal nothing's going to happen to you yeah um and they they basically just assumed that i was a, i was a cokehead or i'd taken mdma or something and yeah. i hadn't taken anything it was a normal day um so they, they they took me through onto the ward they kept me on this thing and i felt absolutely awful not the worst i felt through the whole three months but it was yeah horrendous they kept checking on me and my pulse slowly came down, slowly came down, got to like 150. Yeah. And after two or three hours of your pulse being at this, you feel pretty fucking shit. And uh, they came and gave me uh, bisoprolol, uh, which is a beta blocker. And then my, my pulse came down and they said, oh, look, it's, if, you, if you're if you sure you haven't taken any recreational drugs, then it sounds like anxiety. I was like, well, I'm pretty anxious now, but I was asleep. Yeah. Like, yeah, no, it sounds like anxiety. Make an appointment to see a GP. Um, Right, okay, well, that seems a bit weird, but fine. I mean, maybe maybe I need to take it a bit easy. Maybe I'm stressed. Yeah. I didn't think a lot of it. Um, well, I did think a lot of it, but of course. I was due to take my daughter away to uh, Waterworld, whatever it is, the one at Alton Towers, Splash Landings, the following day. So, or the day after. I spoke to my ex-partner. I explained what had happened. I was like, look, I seem fine now. They said it was anxiety. They've given me some bisoprolol. They gave me two weeks of beta blocker. Just said, take that, get in with your GP, and they'll write you a longer prescription for it. Okay, so I took this, and it was mostly fine. Um, but I was noticing that I'd have little, um, I know now they're called ectopics, where you feel like your your heart's like Mr. Beat. Yeah, I get them. And it's not when your heart's Mr. Beat. It's actually when your heart's tried to do a beat in between two beats. Oh, okay. 
Um, but I would get those. I was I was driving to the swimming thing. I was like, fuck, do I need to turn around? I don't want to put my daughter through something. But at the same time, I don't want to miss out on something if the doctor's right and it's just nothing. Yeah. And we went to that and it was fine. I felt really exhausted. But beta blockers when you start can do that anyway. Didn't think much of it. Um, but then a week later, it happened again. Same thing. Got in, got an ECG. There's nothing wrong with you. Are you sure you're not doing any recreational drugs? I'm fucking sure. So I went to Hench Project, got my blood work done. The only thing in blood work that was a bit off was my hematocrit was high. Didn't think much of it. Hematocrit's a bit high. Fine. I do a phlebotomy to bring down the hematocrit's the thickness of your blood. Do a phlebotomy to bring down thickness of my blood. Do you mind bringing your mic just like uh, maybe? There you go. Perfect. That'll be spot on. Um, there you go. Yeah. I, I bring my hematocrit down. Didn't think much of it. Something we've done. I've done yours. Yeah. Do it all the time. Yeah, normal procedure. Very so normal. Did that. I did do it myself because I didn't want to wait till the following day for Aaron to come. And um, I took a pint of blood out. As I did that, I did that as Stu Edwards, the copper, yep. came in. And he was like, he came in, he was like, are you all right, mate? I was like, yeah, I've just done a phlebotomy. I feel a bit funny. And then I felt that falling sensation again, except I didn't stop falling. I just felt like I was falling. And I started to, my eyes started to go. I started to pass out. He's like, mate, what the fuck's going on? I was like, I, I don't know, ring an ambulance. He rang an ambulance. I'm a policeman and with someone that having a heart attack, um, which is what I thought was going on. Uh, we had a SATS monitor in the clinic, put SATS monitor in my pulse, like 200. Ambulance came, uh, came into what looks like a medical room. Like, what the fuck have you been doing? It's like, oh, I tried to explain, but I was pretty out of it. Put on the ECG. Everything's fine. By this point, things started to calm down. Because I was on the beta blockers, things, yeah. the episodes would only last like half an hour or so. Yeah. They took me in the ambulance, got to hospital. They said, it's a 12-hour wait. I was like, oh, fuck it. I'll just go home. Like, you guys keep telling me I'm fine. I'll go home. Um, finally got in with the GP. They increased the volume of beta blocker I was on, um, which put my blood pressure as low as one, uh, sorry, as low as 70 over 50. Right. So I started to feel really weak. I couldn't really leave the house. And what yeah. happened was these episodes started happening. These episodes when my pulse would go to 220 or whatever, two, three times a day, but only for five or 10 minutes. So I was then rendered completely incapable of doing anything. And every time it happened, I'm going to die. And over the course of the next couple of months, I had a few that were so violent that I was like, fuck. and I'd, I'd rush to hospital, I'd get put on the ECG, uh, I, I spoke to a private doctor. They told me to buy this like miniature ECG thing you can do to check. And we started finding that I was having like lots and lots of these ectopic things. And the doctors started saying I had a thing called uh, SVT, which is effectively a short circuit in your heart, um, which won't kill you. They're like, it won't kill you. It's very unpleasant, but it won't kill you. And there's a treatment. They go up through your leg and they, they burn the part of the heart that's short circuited. Problem yeah. goes away. Relatively routine. We can get you in in about 18 months. So I can't work. I remember speaking to you. Yeah. And, and like I, I, I've never said anything, but you were one of the only people I spoke to. Yeah. Um, and I was like, if this is just the way I'm stuck, I don't want to be alive. Yeah. Because I, I couldn't do that. anything. And I was deadly serious. And you, you were deadly serious to the point where I was kind of like, don't be silly, man. Not, like, not like in a like, in, in I want to. But I couldn't say that, you know. Not in a like, I want to kill myself way. No, you, a, were, you were done. Like, you were tired. Fuck this. Yeah. yeah. I think at that point, I'd had two, two and a half months of, yeah, of you, just feeling awful all day every day not been able to do anything and you were you were in your house like pretty much 24 hours there at this point as well well we started to find that uh so the doctors tried me on a different medication at this point called fleconide which is a, an arrhythmia drug um which kind of helped and kind of didn't but we found that i became super uh body position became super posture became so basically if i stood up it would trigger an episode Right, yeah. So let's say you do something like, if you stand up now, your heart rate's supposed to go up by about 10 beats per minute. Yeah. Except okay, mine yeah. would go up by 100. Yeah. And then I'd pass out. And this just became, so we we really didn't know what the hell was going on. And um, we spoke to uh, a private clinic in London and they sent this chest monitor that I had to wear. And that said that I was having, um, a normal person should have about 100 ectopics a day. You don't even know. Yeah. I was having two or 3,000. Wow. But they didn't know why. Yeah. This is fucking really weird and no one seems to know. And the only thing I get told is your ECG is fine. Your echo is fine. So whatever it is isn't going to kill you. Yeah. Which doesn't 
help when you can't do anything. Your life's gone. Yeah. So I then got recommended by a lady called Vanessa to go and speak to a Dr. Lencioni at the Birmingham Heart Rhythm Group in Birmingham. Can't recommend him enough to anyone. And and within half an hour of going in to see him, he was like, I think I know what this is. Um, it's probably SVT or it could be this other thing called inappropriate sinus tachycardia. Um, and we can do uh, a CT angiogram to make sure there's no physical issues with your heart. Yep. And then we can do an electrophysiology study where they put the thing up in your groin and they, they look around the inside of your heart. And then if there is a problem, they fix it. Um, do you have health insurance? I was like, no, I don't have health insurance, but just what is it? I'll pay. He's like, would you have a referral? I, like, I don't have a referral, but I'll, I'll pay. And he was like, well, look, it's going to be about £14,000. I was like, and then you'll that'll fix it. I'm, he's like, I'm very confident that I can either fix that or if I can't fix it, I'll be able to tell you exactly what the problem is and therefore give you the correct medication to resolve it. Um, it's like, fine, when can you get me in? And within seven days, bear in mind I hadn't been to work for three months, within seven days I'd had all of the tests, the, the CT angiogram, which is very unpleasant if you ever have one, and then I was on the operating table to be operated on and it turned out I had something called inappropriate sinus tachycardia which is a relative condition to something called POTS, posterior orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Basically, your heart is controlled by the AV node at the top of your heart. That sets the rhythm for the rest of your heart. And my one had become inflamed for reasons. Normally, I don't want to say the C word, but normally he would see one or two people a year with this condition. Yeah. Since the global human malware situation um he saw something like 70 or 80 people with this condition some of which had had the magic medicine from the government to make it go away mm -hmm. and some of which had just had the illness that was going around regardless yeah neither of those things seems to be particularly good for you and uh so that's that's what it was so he's like look i can't fix it but i think this medication called ivabradi will help He's like your, your gp probably won't want to prescribe it because it's not actually for this condition on label but I've used it with people in the past and and it's been really good. So, you know, I'll try anything at this point because I, I don't know what the fuck else to do. Within two days of starting that medication, it's fine. And uh, I haven't had any problems since. That's amazing. Um, literally within two days of starting this medication. Um, I'm now weaning off the medication. My echo before showed that I had slight, uh, slightly reduced heart output. Yeah, I've been doing loads of cardio. That's now back to where it should be. Yeah, and I'm. I have to say, man, without you know, <laughs> I'm proud of you, dude. <laughs> like you have been, you've been keeping up your cardio. Wait, wait, shit like that and changes that, your priorities. And that's not like something you've done ever. Yeah, no, but it does. It changes your priorities. It. Um, I I feel very. This is sound super cringe. I feel very lucky to have been ill, because it changed my life priorities. Yeah. Um, and I feel very lucky that actually I I have no long-term heart problems. I have no heart disease. I have no calcium. I have no plaque. I have no long-term issues as a result of steroid use. But if I'd never got ill and I'd carried on for another 10 years, I may well have done. Yeah. Um, so I feel like I've done the bodybuilding thing. I've done the strongman, the powerlifting thing. And I don't feel like I've got anything to prove with that anymore. And I'm now enjoying the fitness thing. Sure. And I still really enjoy helping people achieve their bodybuilding goals. Yep. But for me, I've I've done my time. Yeah, and I feel the same. You know, it might might be some point in my life where I want to get into like elite level shape. Don't know if that would ever equate to me getting on stage. But I just, I just don't feel like I have to step on stage to kind of get that sense of accomplishment. You know, it was it had a time and a place for me, like yourself, like the whole, com all of competing, and you know, I got to meet you and a whole host of different people, and it's opened doors for me and given me experiences. But um, I'm I'm really happy with just you know working on my fitness overall. I I still love being around bodybuilding, and yeah. I, I, I love the passion people have for it, and I'm I'm still super passionate for it. I just I think I think we all have a kind of not a sell by date, but um let's say we've got a bucket and in that bucket we we can pour stupid shit into our bucket yeah um and it'll be fine and then there'll come a point where it'll start to overflow and i think as long as you stop doing stupid shit before your bucket's full yeah you're fine 
Totally. And and I feel like I've walked away with a bucket probably two thirds full. Yeah. Because we both used to do a lot of stupid shit. Oh, Me, yeah, you and sure. Ben Chow, all of us were hundred percent. You know, um reckless. Yes. I've I've done silly things with Pro- gear. I mean, more more so than I realise. I've re- realised, yeah. you know, the stuff that I've for done. Sure. That when people come to me now and say they're doing things that aren't as bad as what I used to do, I'm like, oh my god, you're a fucking idiot, <laughs> you know. Uh, I was talking to someone the other day, and they were like, well, what, uh, we'll talk about Anavar. Mm-hmm. They're like, well, how much Anavar would you run? I was like, well, what have you been told to? And they said, oh, I've been told to run uh, 75. I wasn't sure if I should run 50. I was like, well, I've done 200, 200 before. Yeah, yeah. They're like, but why? I was like, it's really fucking good. Yeah, works really well. Like, but do you need that much? Like, I don't know. I never did a hundred. <laughs> straight um, to two hundred. Yeah, straight to two hundred. Oh, well, do well, not. How let... long for? Oh, Twelve weeks. Rick what? says it's really good to take two hundred milligrams of Anavar. Like it, it's good in terms of how you look for that short period of time that you're taking it, and that's like that's about as far as it goes. Yeah, I'm not sure it'd be particularly good for muscle building. No, it's, um, but great it does, pumps. It gives a great look. Great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah really full. People talk about Anavar not giving you kind of a hardness. It will if you take enough, and and, and if you haven't taken a lot before as well. Mm. Yeah, it's very. It's a yeah. Um, I mean, I actually think I preferred fifty percent Anavar, fifty percent Winstrol. That was a good mix. Yeah. Um, Winavar, Winavar. But uh, but yeah, no. I, so I, I, that's my kind of philosophy on bodybuilding. Stanavar. Do it, that's Stanavar. It's yeah. Um, do it. Enjoy it. But, but know where to step away from the table. Because 100%. it's gambling like anything. And you know what? You could be really unlucky and get fucked first time out. Yep. But for the majority of people, that's not going to be the case. Most people in there, I, I, I caveat this with, do as, don't do as I say or as I do. Most people in their 20s can get away with a lot. 100%. And when yeah. you're in your 30s, you can get away with a bit less. And yep. when you're in your 40s, you need to really think about what you're doing. Yeah. And that's just based off the experience I have with people in our clinic and dealing with, you know, I, I've been dealing with people for on, on, 10 years now in terms of blood work and stuff. And on the flip side, I've seen guys in their 40s start, yeah, but correctly and transform their lives. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So the a thing that we do at Strom now that we don't shout about, because it's Aaron's project, it's not a Strom thing, is he does TRT. Yeah. Um, and, and, and male TRT is something that, I think so important and and so taboo. Yep. Um, but I've had one guy in particular, and it's on my mind because he he came to me today about something. Come to me about a month or two ago because I just I just linked him and said, look, you know, he, he was a friend of mine. He's not a bodybuilder. He'd been mm-hmm. really struggling with kind of his sense of well being, libido. His relationship was on the rocks. That kind of stuff. Yeah. Actually, there's there's two, but this one in particular. And uh, I put him in touch with Aaron. He's been on TRT six months. His relationship better than ever. And he, he genuinely says we saved his life. Yeah. Uh, which we didn't. He saved his life. But if you've no idea, you know, I think us as a bodybuilding community, if we get to our 40s and we start to have low test, we'd be much more aware of it because we know the kind of symptoms and the signs. Yeah. But if you're a member of the general public, you could be completely and totally unaware. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Yeah, there's um, there's there's still definitely a um, uh, an, an area of massive uncertainty with the general public when it comes to bodybuilding and and just stereotyping as a whole. Well, my dad's my dad's fifty three, and yeah. my dad's I think you've met my dad. He, he's fit and healthy. He's high a lot of the time. So yeah, I think I did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I've I've said to him, you know, come down, get your get your test levels checked. Yep. Um, he's oh no, there's nothing wrong with my test levels. Like, well, you, you don't know. You don't know, you're 53, and actually, if, if your test levels are low, it, it could affect your quality of life quite severely. Yeah. Nothing wrong with my test levels. All right, fine. I'm not saying you're not a man. <laughs> it's not a criticism. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. But it wouldn't hurt to check. Yeah. Um, but I do get that that kind of generational thing, guys in their 40s, particularly if you've not been around testosterone, Yeah. might take it as a personal slight. People, people definitely don't understand the difference between TRT and cycles. You know, and like I was, I was having a conversation. Sports with, TRT. Yeah, there's that as well. And um, you know, I was having a chat with someone in the gym recently, which doesn't happen as much these days. But now I'm back in kind of like a gym that's got bodybuilders in it. I had a guy come up and talk to me about his legit TRT. He was on a TRT dose. I think it was one fifty or one seventy five every seven to ten days. Yeah. I was like, brilliant. That's perfect. And then um, his buddy's like, yeah, I've been taking T400. 
I might do that's uh that's not trt yeah that's yeah. not trt that was his mate and we, we it was funny because even his mate just turned around and was like yeah dude that's uh you know you might want to rethink that one so, yeah. so, so how do i make that trt then i was like you're probably gonna want to take like a quarter of the dose of what you're taking yeah and um and he was like you know funny enough you say you say that you know because i went from being on a little bit less than half the dose i was on before and now i'm at uh, you know, messing around with the T400, he's like, I actually do feel worse. I was like, yeah, does that really surprise you? You know, like- I mean, the TRT thing's interesting because we do find that different people will need different amounts of testosterone yeah. to be in range. Like, I, I'm sure Crossland won't mind me saying his own TRT, he needs, I'm sure he said it's 65 or 70 milligrams a week yeah. for him to be in range. Yeah. Um, I know he's using pharma stuff, so... Yeah. Um, I run... 200 megs of sip every 10 to 12 days yeah i was doing smaller amounts dosed and that's, interval. that seems to be quite effective as well it was very good and actually i think i was much more level emotionally physically yeah but i, I forget yeah and that's that's a big one that sucks like having to do it multiple times throughout the week but it, there seems to be a a, a a point in which guys feel significantly better when you hit that sweet spot. Yeah, like loads better, and then they go above it, and that so they, they leave that. Yeah, you know, it's like and that. The other that thing, area if you are of, a bodybuilder, because a lot of people will TRT and blast or TRT yeah. and cycle or whatever. If you are a bodybuilder, the lower you can get that cruise while still being within the normal physiological range for testosterone, the more you're going to notice when you're on your blast. 100%. Because yeah. the closer those two are, the less of a differential you're going to get between the two. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. Okay. I'd, I'd actually love to talk about um, how you've handled the rapid expansion success. Oh, um, badly. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think if I was better at business and, and perhaps more corporate, we could be twice the size that we are now. Mm. Um, I'm very funny about raw ingredients. I'm very funny about manufacture. I'm not good with change. Uh, and there are things that I could have done in terms of getting commercial funding and moving to perhaps a larger factory mm-hmm. and doing big, big runs of things that would allow us to scale into other countries a lot easier. But then I'd lose control of large portions of the process. I'd lose control of quality. There are we, we we talked about that like early on as well. Like if you were to end up giving a significant portion of your company to someone else or other people, is it really your business? How much control do you have? And the and Strom is very much you're the face of Strom. Yeah, yeah. I mean there are there are companies I've mentioned today that started around the same time as us that I know are doing double the volume that we do. And they're probably doing a really good job of it because maybe their owners aren't control freaks and they've got people in that are really good to do all the individual tasks. But but I really like what we do. I'm super proud of everything we do. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess I can sit there and say, oh, we, we could scale so much more, we could be so much bigger. At the same time, we've still grown consistently year on year um, while not compromising on what we do. Do you, do you think, this is probably the first time I've... I've noticed this, but do you think that your connection with Strom is a direct relation to the relationship that you have with your customers? And and like think of that in terms of like the athletes that hang around you as well, because they're kind of not that a lot of them aren't your customers anymore because they've become yeah. your athletes, but like a lot of them, like you know, you, you talk to, you get the feedback of them, you get the vibe, you yeah. get the, and it's like it's like the the family the athletes are family but then it feels like everyone outside of that extends into the family as well because when we go to the events the people come up and they just feel like yeah i think that's something that we do i'm happy to say that's something we do better than any other brand 100 percent. you know i don't think that as a team of bodybuilders we are the absolute cream of the crop bodybuilding wise <laughs> no. but i think we're the cream of the crop socially yeah 100%. um yeah definitely. which is maybe not the most important attribute but we have a great time. We very much are a family. We really do care about people's results and, and people achieving whatever it is they want to achieve. Yeah. Um, we're not one of these brands or one of these groups of people that's ever been, you know, if, if there's someone on our team that 
um, has a worse physique than the other members. You know, it's not something that we, we particularly care about. You know, people's no. value isn't determined by their physique. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in fact, me, you, uh, Andrew Keeler, we're probably the three OGs. We've probably, I don't know about Andy at the moment, actually. He, he varies, but I certainly speak for me and you. We are probably in the worst shape we've been <laughs> Yeah, you know, you're still in decent shape, but no, we're, we're not in the shape we were in five years Definitely ago. Definitely not, no. But our value is, or our relevance, is no less. Oh, it's valid. nice. It's nice to know that. But I, I, I know where you're coming from. It's you nice know, to know that like, from from my perspective as well. I, I thought that by because my, basically, I was I was powerlifting up to the time I got ill, and I was I was in big, if a little bit chubby shape but mm. i was big i was i was pretty strong probably the strongest i've ever been actually in certain movements um and i was really worried you know i was ill i didn't do anything for three or four months and then i had two or three months of just getting back into a groove with it um and i thought people would would care and they don't no. you know people people know that my knowledge and my understanding of things is exactly the same as it was absolutely when i was bigger and then at the moment I, i'm now exploring the cardiovascular fitness side of things and it's allowing me to to take a real personal interest in that yeah while still people come in to ask me about bodybuilding, strongman, powerlifting. Yeah. Um, but I do think that that's quite unusual within the industry. Yeah, absolutely. How have you, how have you found through d developing your success, your relationship with certain people has changed? Obviously, you know, you get, like we talked about earlier, we get a few, those few people that, they they get negative of, of the sign of you, you know, buying yeah. a nice new car and you're doing well. I um being ill was interesting because there were a lot of people who just disappeared. Um I had I talked about it, I had therapy last year with James Elliott to deal with panic attacks that were subconscious panic attacks. It's not like I was sat there going, Oh, I'm scared because I've been ill. I'd be asleep and then I'd just wake up going <gasps> and it it was shit. And I went to see James and said, look, I'm not interested in talking about my feelings and stuff. I just want to fix that. Yeah. And unfortunately, I had to talk about my feelings to fix that, which I don't. I still don't really know what me and James talked about that made that go away. But he does remind me that it's not like a transactional, you you have this conversation and then that thing changes. It's more about a process. Yeah, for sure. Um, but one of the things he got me to do in that was was to go through my phone. And if you want to make yourself feel shit about yourself, we'll do this. Go through your phone and and of all the conversations in your WhatsApp, how many of those are non-transactional? In how many of those people have messaged you, not because they want something from you? And it's probably not many. Mm. And the better you do, the more of those conversations will be transactional. Mm -hmm. You know, there might be one from your mum asking, "Hey, yeah." Um, and we're we're guilty of it. You know, I I I've been guilty of it. Um, with people, you know, you only message them oh, when you want sure. something. And it might not be that you want, you, you might not realise you're doing it. You might find an excuse to message them, hey, bro, how's it going? And then three or four messages deep, oh, by the way, yeah, for sure. Can you knock out that reel for me? Yeah. Um, and I don't think the point of it was that they're all bad people. It's just something you need to be aware of. Yeah. And sure. actually, if, if a relationship is entirely transactional, as long as this transaction is going both ways, that's fine. But But you need to be aware of it. And yeah. it's it's important. Yeah, no, I um, you know, I, I agree with you. And even you verbalising it is probably going to make me pay a little bit more attention to that. Just, just anyone who's watching, if you want to feel shit about yourself, yeah, just. But then, what what that does mean is that if you're in a position where you haven't got anything to give, the people that are still there are the people that you probably want in your life. Yeah, you know. Yeah, um, and there will be people that are still there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully. Yeah, and um, you know, I, I think it's uh, easy to not notice the amount of people that are around you as well. You know, um, yeah. that and 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 even just to you know reach out to them, say hello. Yeah, yeah, and, and and you know what? I've from that conversation, I noticed there were certain people that I maybe only messaged when I it's at hundred percent when I want something, and then I'm like, you know what? Actually, why don't I just reach out to them yep. for no reason? Mm -hmm. And actually, if you start doing that with people that you've had a primarily primarily transactional relationship with, it tends to throw them. Yes, 
because they know that you only message, not consciously, not always fucking messaging because you want something, but they're like, well, so what can I do for you? No, nothing. I'll just say, no, you are. Yeah. Um, so trying to change that nature of relationship that you have, because I think it's something that particularly in the modern world, we fall into the habit of doing because we're used to people just being there at the end of the and phone whenever we need them. One thing to say as well is like, uh, you know, as, as, as you uh, go down entrepreneurial ship or at least business, you do find less time. Yeah. And you just become, you, you, you get into a habit of becoming more efficient, sending shorter texts, being more to the point. And sometimes I call people up and I'm like, oh, I don't want to waste their time. I'll just ask them straight away. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. Rather than like beating around the bush. Cause I feel like, I, I guess for a lot of other people, it might be different. But I feel like if someone calls me up and they're just like, look, I just want this, you know, like, you know, brrr, and I'm like, oh yeah, cool, sounds. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a, an awareness no. thing. And, and it, in retrospect, it's probably a better idea that I probably spend a couple of seconds, you know, thinking about that before I just, you know, call someone to ask for something. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, again, if uh, there are people that I know I only message when I want something and they only message me when they want something. Yeah. Um, and we both know that. It's yeah. fine. Yeah. Um, but it's when, so, hey, buddy, hey, mate, it's good to see you. Yeah, anyway, sure. I need that thing. Yeah. Cause and then you don't hear from him again. Yeah. I think it's clear to like state like there's there's no problem in, you know, calling your mates and asking for something because it swings both ways. Yeah. And, you know, like you said, it's transactional as long as it's balanced, then like. But, but there is something that's not okay about calling someone your mate because you've asked for something. Yeah. Because that's not the same. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, we, we can all do it. It's just something that I've tried to become more consciously aware of. And those people that do message you just to ask how you are, it's very easy to just not reply or, or fob them off because you're busy. But maybe take the time to reply to those guys because they're the guys that actually probably give a fuck. Absolutely. So going forward, 2023, what are your plans? So... Obviously, there's a lot of FitX stuff going on in 2023. Um, the Expo's in Manchester this year. For those who mm. don't know, I am a director of FitX. Um, I'll be interested to see how that goes. It's, it, it's a different venue for us. We've not been there before. Early bird sales, of uh, the, the, the first ticket uh, releases have just gone out, and they've gone well, actually. Yep. Um, there's a lot of shows on this year. I don't know how many I'm going to be able to get to personally. We did 12 last year. I went to nine. Um, there's 16 this year. I'd like to go to more. Yeah. I didn't go to... I went to most of them the We've first year. We've got one year. down this way this year. That's cool. Um, yeah, because I went most of them the first year. Yeah. And then I went to hardly any of them last year. Yeah. But that was just out here then everywhere. Yeah. Um, so we've got FitX stuff. Strong wise, um, we've got a few products coming out. We've got the meal replacement. We've got a ZMA coming out, which I'm quite mm -hmm. looking forward to. I'm it's, very much looking forward it's to It's very ZMA. good, actually. Um, we've also got a um, world exclusive, heard it here first, something called Quatrifolic, which is a glucosamine bonded folate, uh, which is a, a, re a lot of people are deficient in folate. This is a really good form of folate. Uh, that we, the guys at the Blood Low actually wanted a folate tablet. So this is just the best form of folate I could find in the world. It comes from Sweden. Mm -hmm. The main goal, um, and this is me perhaps trying to be a little bit more business and a little bit more marketing, is to release as many, not as many as possible, but but to make sure we've got a bit more variation in in flavors and sizes mm -hmm. in products. Like Systomax, it's been out for four years. We do one flavor and one size. We do blueberry in 30 servings. Mm -hmm. We've got guys that have bought that every month for three years. Um, and if you look at the brands, you know, guys like Naughty Boy, guys like Applied that are killing it, they've got like eight flavors in their pre-workout and stuff. Um, I think my mindset with bodybuilding has always been like it's bodybuilding, not ballet dancing, get yeah, the fuck on with it. And a lot of people just neck it. But from a commercial perspective, yep. I think the consumer would like to see more flavors. It's and also... scalable that way, isn't it? Yeah, I... I there's nothing in our range where it's like lack. It's like, well, I can't do more flavors in that because we need a fucking yeah. joint product. Like, I, it's kind of all there. Yeah. So, so I want to I want to try and get that done and, and make sure that we've got kind of at least three or four flavors in every product. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've had a distributor in Holland for years that have been really good. Total Body Shop. Yeah. I don't know what's going on with those guys, but there's not as much business coming through that channel as they're perhaps used to. So um, there's a huge distributor in Holland called Prometheus. If you guys are from Total Body Shop are listening, I would love to get things back to where they were, but 
There's yeah, a huge distributor in Prometheus. A very good relationship, those guys. Yeah, they're great guys. But yeah. there's a huge distributor in Holland called Prometheus, and they've been kind of knocking on the door, and they do all yeah. of Europe. Um, and then the States, USA. The only way to make that work, really, is to have your products produced under license in America. Yeah. And and regulations in America are a little bit less strict, which is why a lot of Americans like to buy strong products and get them shipped over because they know mm. that the quality is going to be bang on. So I think that means holiday. Yeah. Like Poland. Yeah, exactly like Poland. <laughs> exactly like Poland, probably with slightly less whiskey. Probably not, actually. Um, so, no, that, I mean, that's... that's... So for those that don't know, I'll go over it really briefly, but me, me and Rick both got our tits done in... We've uh, got beautiful nipples. Yeah, fantastic nipples. We uh, both had gynecomastia and uh, went over to Poland, shot some guns, drank some whiskey and got our titties out. Honestly, like I, I would go back and do that again. Oh, it's great. It's one of the only places I can think of that I could go and I would just stay in a hotel and not book. Just go out like anything. we did. It, it was, was great. Fantastic. We went to uh, Ro- Roklov, Roklov. Uh, yeah, that's it, yeah. Um, and there was a think, place where think, you can shoot guns. I think it's called Krakow. Uh, well, there's a place where you can shoot guns and uh, it's one of the least fucks given place ever. Like you go in and yeah. you pay your money and you pick the gun you want. Yeah, well, we, we, we were going to go to Auschwitz. We yeah. were going to rent a car out. And then it was a bit too late in the day, so we turned around. There was just, coincidentally a tram going past with a sign with. And we spoke to a taxi it. driver. Hey, yeah. where do we go shoot the guns? I can take you to shoot the guns. <laughs> I think his name was Alexander as well. Mm. Like, and uh, I was like, ah, shit, I haven't got any ID. I haven't got my passport. He's like, no problem. And turned up, and they were just like, what do you want to shoot? And there's, you'd tell, then they tell you how much it is, and they give you like a thirty-second safety briefing. Yeah, I particularly like that they just give you the gun and the magazine. <laughs> and if you're like, hey, buddy, I don't really know what to do with this. They're like, ha ha, pussy. <laughs> um, yeah, it was fucking great. Um, it was brilliant. But yeah, no, it's, um, I mean, I've seen video, like Aaron Hudson did some videos from when he went out shooting in uh, America and stuff. And it still looked quite, you know, you you go here, you do this, you point this way. Yeah. Whereas these guys just didn't give a fuck. No, like the guy that was like instructing us, like, he just disappeared when we were shooting. Yeah. Yeah, like we could have very easily just shot each other. And <laughs> yeah, like there was no one there going, hey, don't be cunts. <laughs> In fact, they came out at the end and gave us a sawn off shotgun. Pistol, shotgun pistol. Yeah. Shotgun pistol. Yeah, yeah, that was mega. That was quite painful. Yeah. Um, and um, also, if you've been to Liverpool or Manchester... They've got these little scooter things. Yeah. And they're crap in the UK because they go about three miles an hour. Mm-hmm. In Poland, they're amazing. Yeah, they go really quick. And they, go, they, they, go, they feel even quicker when you're wearing a surgical vest. Yeah, yeah, very nearly binned it. That would have been a wicked end of the holiday. How do you rip your tit open? Well, funny story. Um, but yeah, honestly, Poland, if you're Polish, I don't know why the fuck you live here. If, like, if you're Polish and you live in England, I don't know why you're here. Poland's amazing. Why are you here? It is, it is a fantastic country. Well, I've got, there's a there's a guy who comes in my shop called Adrian. He's Polish. And when I ask him, he says, oh, they send all the cunts here. <laughs> so, okay, good. <laughs> um, <laughs> Perfect. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah fine. Makes sense. Yeah, totally. But no, beautiful country. Beautiful country. And everyone was lovely. Everyone was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, everyone was brilliant. And the gym was amazing. The gym was we didn't really tra- I didn't train, but... We mainly used the shower. Yeah, because we smelled. stunk. Yeah. And they, were, they told us, well, we thought we couldn't have a shower. Yeah. And it turns out, like... You could have a shower. You could have oh, a shower. Oh, fucking brilliant. And we were a couple of days non-showered and, yeah. Had to fly. Yeah. <laughs> Had to fly. <laughs> so, yeah, look, if you want a cheap holiday destination, go to Poland, book yeah. into a hotel, go shoot some guns, eat some sushi, uh, go to whiskey in a jar. Yep. Try and flirt with the waitress. Fail. Um, brilliant. A little skater punk waitress. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you remember. I remember. Yeah. She had like those little van checkered shoes on. Yeah, she did. Yeah, she did. <laughs> yeah, she definitely thought we were idiots, but that's fine. Or gay. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> when me and Tariq go traveling, we get that a lot. Oh, I bet. Me and Tariq went in, dressed up in our fancies. We went to Marco Pierre White Steakhouse the other yeah. day, and people definitely thought we were gay. Oh, 100%. Which I don't think Tariq minded. No. No. All right, so, um, mate, I think we should wrap it up. It's been an absolute pleasure. Pleasure, man. Can you um, tell everyone where to find you if they already don't? Oh, um, Strom underscore sports underscore nutrition. Uh, there's like a link in bio thing where if you want to talk to me about drugs, you can book in for a consult. I do that like as professionally now. 
Um, and we've got links to all our other different. You've just been talking about drugs for years and never got paid for it. Exactly. Yeah. One day it's like, hey, maybe people should pay me for this. <laughs> um, I think we have Twitter and TikTok and all that, but I never go on any of them. So yeah, Instagram is I still think the one. Yeah. Um, or Facebook, or you can email me Richard at stromsports.com, but please don't. <laughs> there you go. Right. Brilliant, mate. Thank you so much. Thank you.